you'll know I'll, I'll welcome you when it. Okay. Good afternoon, Jane Buffard. Well, good morning to you. You're out on the West Coast. I am. Good morning. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for joining us on our Marcy's Law interview series, Why We Do What We Do. Um, we've had many, many, many interviews with victims' rights um, advocates and victims' rights leaders all throughout the country uh, since we started this interview series. And every now and then, we find people like you who have really been at the forefront of not just victims' rights advocacy, but Marcy's Law itself. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for everything you've done for victims' rights and for Marcy's Law. And I wanna get a little bit into the story about how you came uh, to, to be connected with Marcy's Law. But first, tell us a little bit about the organization that you're the president of, Justice for Homicide Victims. Um, I'm president of Justice for Homicide Victims here in Los Angeles. And what we do is we provide support to families, members of victims, and we accompany them to court, try to explain to them how, what their rights are and things that they should do. So, you know, that's basically what we do. We provide a lot of training. If people want to fight for their rights, we, we fight with them for their rights, so. Yeah, and, and that's, that's how we usually start these interviews. Tell us a little bit about what you do and then the name of the series, why we do what we do. And sadly, the people who are the most committed and the most effective in this, in this movement and in this cause uh, have been touched personally by tragedy and you are certainly no exception. So I, I wanna have you think back to 1996, you were living in Cerritos, California at the time and your mom and dad, Gladys and Elmer were living in Southgate, which was pretty close by, right? Correct, about 15 miles away. T tell us a little bit about the neighborhood that your mom and dad were living in at the time. It was a, we thought it was a relatively safe neighborhood. It was an older neighborhood of uh, suburb of Los Angeles, and it had been there since World War II and growing and maybe changing a little bit, but it was still a safe neighborhood. Yeah, and, and there was um, there were some neighbors um, next to your mom and dad. Uh, there was there was a woman um, who was a single mom, and she had uh, she had uh, a two two little girls a 12 year old and an eight year old that became pretty close with your with your parents? Yes, she did. Um, Jackie was the 12 year old. They would come to my mother's house after school every day and she would help them with their homework. And um, she would make cookies with them and taught them how to make pies. And, and my mother was giving Jackie the 12 year old typing lessons. She wanted to type so that she could get a computer. And back in 96, they weren't giving the typing lessons in school like they do today. And so she, my mother was working with her on her typing lessons. And you received a call, the call that nobody wants to receive back in February 11th, 1996, that something had happened uh, to your mom and dad. Could you tell us, tell us what happened? A neighbor from across the street called um, my house about 9.30 on that Sunday morning and said, you know, something's going on at your folks' house. There's... Um, police are there and fire engines and all this kind of stuff. And I said, you know, my dad's elderly. He was um, 79. My mother was 74. I said there, um, you know, maybe something happened to my, um, to my dad. And he said, I understand they both were stabbed to death. And at that point, I just threw the phone and my husband caught it. <laughs> I don't even, somehow. And um, then they ended up getting one of the sheriff's deputies that was there on the scene to talk to me on the phone. And he just told me to come to the Southgate Police Department and that somebody would talk to me there. I went to the Southgate Police Department and all they would confirm that somebody had been murdered at my parents' address. And, but they wouldn't confirm who it was or, and they said, just, you know, go home and somebody will be in touch with you. And, so and at some point you found out who was the first person who actually probably saw your parents uh, through the window that something had happened to them? Your little girl, Jackie, from next door came over at 9.30 that Sunday morning for her typing lesson with my mom. And she saw in the side window by the front door, um, saw my dad laying on the floor and that there was blood around him. 
and she ran home screaming to her family that something had happened next door. And um, they, there, that family called the police and the police came out and um, later that afternoon, they arrested her dad. And so it was her dad um, who did not live with them, um, but came, came around every now and then who, who right. it was ultimately determined was the killer. Yes, yes. He had um, apparently spent the day in a bar with a woman and um, he had taken her home that night and she wouldn't let him come in. And this, I get all of this from the testimony that she provided in court that um, he took her home and she wouldn't let him in because he didn't have any money. And so he decided that he would get money from my folks. He had, from what I learned later, he had apparently borrowed $100 from my parents earlier that week because he needed food for his family. And so um, the police speculated that my mother told him, I have to go to the bank and get the money and I'll be back by about this afternoon, I'll have it for you. And um, then he, with that Sunday morning, he said, I, I watched and you never went to the bank. You have money here, I need a hundred dollars. And apparently she said no. And so I guess he hit her a few times and ended up stabbing her to death. He stabbed her 39 times and left her dead on the kitchen floor in front of her refrigerator. And, and then he and, walked over to- I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he walked over to my um, stepdad who had woke up during the middle of all this commotion and came out and he was in a wheelchair and he um, came over and he stabbed him 19 times and he died and slipped out of his wheelchair. And- uh, other testimony uh, you and I were talking about revealed that there was also a fresh pot of coffee that had been made uh, yes. in the kitchen. So I, you know, they speculated that she had made a pot of coffee, was going to try and talk to him, calm him down or whatever. And that apparently didn't work either. And this was the, the same person who your mom had just loaned a hundred dollars to, to, to get food for his family. Correct, correct. And it was also the same person whose daughter ultimately saw this brutal scene through the window. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that, that's, that's one of the things that, that we see all the time in homicides, that the, the ripple effects and all of the people uh, that it affects um, in addition to, in, in addition to the, the, victims, the victim's family, like yourself and your husband at the time and your brothers, and siblings and these two little girls who were so close, you were telling me um, to your mom and dad, you told me so many great stories that, 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 that she, she called them grandma and grandpa. Yeah, the kids, the kids did. They were broken hearted that they were gone. They spent a lot of time with my folks. And um, I mean, he, he really, it was, you know, two families that, that were broken hearted over everything and then became against each other during a court process. Because and, you know, his family didn't want him to go to jail, and we wanted him to go away, <laughs> wherever. Yes, and so to 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 that point, about eighteen months later, uh, there was the trial in November of nineteen ninety seven, and this defendant was found guilty um, at at trial and was convicted. Yes, and. It was, uh, on a lot of DNA evidence at the time then DNA was new, but there was blood spatters on his shoes and on his hands and clothing and so forth that tied him as the only person to the crime. And after he was found guilty for the, for the people who are uh, watching and listening um, in that particular jurisdiction, the penalty phase um, is an entirely separate phase that also took uh, a large amount of time, and you went to you went to the penalty phase as well. Um, yes, and it was a death penalty, correct? Yes, yes. And then yes, he was sentenced to death. He was sentenced to death on, I believe, October fifth of nineteen ninety eight. He was sentenced to death. Correct. And the case has been affirmed. The conviction has been affirmed and upheld at least two times by the state supreme court in California. Yes, yes. And 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 he is now he is now in San Quentin uh, where he remains on death row. Is that right? That's right. He's been there for a little over 20 years now. 
And you, anytime there is a hearing that is involved in the case, um, it's pretty safe to say you're you're there. I'm there. <laughs> I want him to know that I'm still watching. They haven't had too many hearings in the last 20 years, but if they do have a Supreme Court hearing, I've been to both of them. And like I said, I'm watching. And, and I want him to know I don't plan to go away. And I, I want to now um, take you back a little bit further to um, right, at, right after uh, the, the murder occurred in 1996, which happened in February. In April 1996, you told me a story about your brother, Tom, um, I think it is, who, who saw yes. somebody, saw something on TV about a victim's rights memorial and said that you guys should, should attend. Correct. And the um, victim's rights memorial was being held at Rose Hills Cemetery in Whittier, California, which is where my parents were murdered and um, at one of the chapels. And he suggested, why don't we go? So we did. As a family, we went to the memorial. And it was during and, Crime Victims' Rights Week. And they have that memorial every year now uh, in April, correct? Correct. Um, I believe it was 1983 that um, former President Reagan declared a, one week every year to be Crime Victims' Rights Week. And so they've had one every year, every year since that was, declaration was made. Yes, in fact, um, I think you know Colleen Campbell very well from California. I do. I who was do. also one of, our, one of our guests who told us a lot about what the work that she did uh, personally with President Reagan uh, on yeah. victims' rights. And, um, you know, when we have people like you and Colleen Campbell and, uh, and uh, Marcella, Marcy Nicholas's mom, God rest her soul, um, you, you really are the, the people talk about the founding <laughs> fathers of, um, of our nation. You guys are really the founding mothers of the victims' rights movement um, as such as it is. Thank you. And, um, and thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Now, that first time that you went to the memorial in April of 1996, um, you met Marcella, Marcy Nicholas's mom, for the first time. I did. And she, she was a great lady. We became great friends. Yeah. And, and for those who are watching that uh, aren't familiar with the Marcy's Law story, um, Marcy Nicholas, for whom Marcy's Law is named um, and, and championed by her brother, Dr. Henry Nicholas. Um, this is where Marcy Nicholas is also buried, where the same cemetery where your mom and dad are buried. Is that right? Correct. That's correct. And so you saw, you saw Marcy's mom, Marcella, and you guys instantly bonded. We used to talk, we would talk all the time. We, there were many times I need, I, I had no idea what to expect during the trial and what was going to happen. So, and Mar Marcella would take me through it. We would talk for hours on the telephone. I mean, there were times when on a Friday night in particular, we would talk all night while well, she consoled me and tried to, to help me through what I was going through at the time. I mean, losing your parents at the same time, suddenly one day is and to such a brutal crime, an elderly couple, it's like, how does this happen? And so she walked me through a lot of that. Yeah. She's my personal grief, my personal grief counselor. Yeah, and you described it to me. And we've we've talked about the 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 fact that that you became part of a club with with Marcella, part of a club that nobody wants to belong to. And that was always Marcella's favorite phrase, I think, the club that no one wants to join. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we have realized, though, and you and I have talked about, too, it's a club that no one wants to join, but it's a club uh, whose members have bonds that are so strong that support the people within it and give them such strength to do things that they never thought was po were, were possible before they joined the, the, the horrific club that it is. And that's one of the sad things about the pandemic. It's The pandemic has made it so that we're not able to really come together and to hold each other and give each other those hugs and to, and to support one another. Yeah, and so. one of the things that is difficult for every family of, uh, that, that, is, that, is, um, that has experienced what you experience and, and every family of a homicide victim is the actual court process. Uh, because like you said, you, you lost your parents instantly, which is tough enough. And then 
the circumstances surrounding it makes it even more horrific. And then there's this whole other layer that's, that's thrown in, which is the criminal justice system. And it's just a foreign land to anybody who has never been involved in it. And it's such, it, it, it's such a terrible time in your life. It makes it so much more intimidating. And so t- tell us a little bit about how important it was for you to have the support that you did as a surviving uh, family member and particularly what Marcella provided for you. Um, you know, during the early process, they have a court hearing almost every month. And a lot of times, I, I can remember I went to court one time and they were seeking authorization to get him some new shoes, some special shoes that he needed. But Marcella would always tell me, she says, you know, just be brave, don't worry about it. It's going to just go and, and just be there. You're your parents' voice now and just go and attend. And, and then when the trial started, Marcella and Bob walked into the um, court with me with, I mean, they had, they each one had an arm around me and we walked through and everybody in, in the court knew somebody was there, something was happening that day. <laughs> so, and they would drive all the way from the other side of town to um, Norwalk court for hearings every week. To come, so I, to come and be with you. To come and be with me. And yeah. At some point, you learned about the effort in California to enshrine victims' rights in the state constitution of California called Marcy's Law. And this was named, as we were talking about, for Marcy Nicholas um, and would not be possible without the efforts of Dr. Henry Nicholas, Marcy's brother, um, and also Marcy's parents. And Marcy. Marcella and Bob were there for you. And when yes. you heard about Marcy's Law and the efforts that they were, they were undertaking for Marcy's Law, you were there for them and there for us as, as, as a cause. And um, I, at our support meetings every month, we would hear about Marcy's Law and the progress that was being made. And so at one point they started talking about, we need to gather, start gathering signatures as groups. We, needed, we need to start going out and doing that. So my husband and I, decided that we would go three days a week to farmer's markets and gather signatures for Marcy's Law, which we did. And we would talk to people and talk about the 17 constitutional rights that Marcy's Law would provide victims and how that would be better for everyone and parole hearings and, and so forth. And um, so we would go on Fridays, Thursday, Fridays and um, Sundays to various farmer's markets and gather signatures. And then we flew to Sacramento in April, the first part of April, as I recall, and took boxes upon boxes of, of petitions with signatures for Marcy's Law to make the ballot. Back then it was known as Proposition 9, Marcy's Law or the Crime Victims Bill of Rights Act of 2008. And um, so we submitted all of our signatures to the Secretary of State and, um, and it qualified for the ballot. <laughs> So then we had to go back to all these farmers markets and take brochures and encourage everyone you need to go out and vote for Proposition 9 and get this passed. And it was surprising how many people we talked to about parole hearings that they knew somebody or they themselves experienced going to parole hearings year after year after year. So. Yeah, so so you were part of getting it on the ballot. And so um, after that, it doesn't end. That's when it actually gets on the ballot. And then there's more hard work. So you went back to the right. farmer's market again and yes. started to really hap- run, run a political campaign. Let's, let's, you've got to get out and vote for it now, right? We got yeah. it there. And we would put flyers on cars and talk to people at farmer's markets and talk and talk and talk. And, then- and it worked. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. And your work, your work paid off. It passed, and the one of, in the first state is was California back, uh, back when it passed in in two thousand and eight. And but then your work with Marcy's Law still <laughs> didn't end, and still hasn't ended because the the phases of of getting really anything on the ballot, but, but the phases of Marcy's Law are to raise awareness, which you which you were a huge part of, then to get it on the ballot which is just hard work at which you are a part of, and then to get it passed, which is also hard work, which is a statewide political campaign uh, to get people to go out and vote and to vote uh, for Marcy's Law. But then after that is the implementation of Marcy's Law because it's a brand new thing 
for right. victims' families, for victims, uh, and also for law enforcement agencies and district attorney's office and attorney's general office, attorney's general's offices. Um, and so at that point, the education and implementation becomes important. But you made yourself a part of that too. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Um, you know, shortly after it was passed, and it was, it was passed in November of, of 2008, it became effective right as soon as it passed. And we started hearing from people, it's not working. Nobody's implementing this. Nobody knows about it. I never, I didn't get this, or I didn't get this kind of information. And we thought, this is a good time to strengthen our partnership with the law enforcement and the district attorney's office in the community. We would start having some little workshops and tell people what their rights are. And so we, um, we talked to the sheriff's department and he gave us, I mean, he, he agreed that we could do this. He, um, he gave us a room, made a room at the sheriff's department headquarters available to us. And we had somebody from the district attorney's office come in and go over each of the 17 rights and explain exactly what each one of them would provide. And then we would always add something else to the program. We made them on Saturday after Saturday mornings from eight to noon. And we would have them about every six months. And we had four or five of them with the sheriff's department, four or five with Los Angeles Police Department, with Pasadena and with Long Beach, any of the, the larger um, law enforcement agencies here in Los Angeles have all sponsored Crime Victims Rights Weeks, knowing, knowing your rights for victims is what we called them. And we would you know, go in and have, how, how do you plan your parole hearing, for instance, or you know, um, we would have a table of people from various homicide divisions come in and talk about what they do when they get the first call to go out on a homicide, what happens, what happens then? And so we, we did those and we've only stopped during the pandemic, the last year and a half that we've discontinued having them since we can't gather. <laughs> right, but your, your plan, as you and I were talking about, your plan is to, is to re-implement these meetings again once um, everybody can start to gather again. Exactly. Yeah, we've and, had a and, lot of changes in law enforcement here in Los Angeles, so we need to get some more people involved. Yeah, t t tell me a little bit about those uh, changes in law enforcement in Los Angeles and to the extent that they, that they are raising a concern for you as a, uh, as a surviving member of a, of a homicide victim. Well, we before that, we've had a number of changes in the Sheriff's Department and in the LAPD. And um, now there are some controversies over our district attorney and what some of the things that he's doing that so, and I, they're initiating a recall in that area. So we'll see what happens. But you plan on attending every single hearing or anything at all that is related to uh, the defend the, the person, the killer on, on death row in San Quentin who killed your parents. I'll be there. <laughs> He's not going to get rid of me that easy. And when you're talking about these meetings that, you, that you've that you been holding every six months, the first one, just to give people a sense, this isn't two or three people that you gather. The first one that you had in 2009, you said you had uh, 100 or so people there. Oh, yeah. We get the um, sheriff's department or the policing agency, whoever is sponsoring this, we put them on. They're like regular workshops. There's a, um, we hand out an, an agenda of what's going to happen. We give everybody a folder and we get the um, district attorney's office, the Bureau of Victim Services, she would make a PowerPoint presentation and we encouraged everybody to do PowerPoint presentations and to go through. And we, we provide copies of all that, provided a little, sometimes lunch sandwiches, sometimes morning, you know, donuts and things like that. And it was all sponsored by the, um, whoever, was, whoever was sponsoring the event. It got to the point that on our flyers that we would, we, they would send out flyers to their um, neighborhood watch programs and to all the their homicide areas. And there would be, you know, 60 to 100 people or more, depending on the size of the room that we could get. <laughs> we always had a big crowd that attended, so. And we started getting lots of requests to put on more, more meetings out of the county. And we, at, we, kind of, we stayed within Los Angeles County, but we had requests from San Bernardino and Redlands and Orange County, all if we would come out and do crime victims things, it was the, We'll show you how they're really easy to put together, right? So, yeah, <laughs> no, it's 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 really incredible the work that that you that you have done and and dating it back to when you first met Marcella is really particularly personally touching to everyone in the Marcy's Law family. 
um, and really shows uh, what what people can do if they have a passion for it, like you like you do. Now, there's also a um, a memorial every April at the uh, Justice for Homicide Victims Memorial. It was virtual last year, but um, can you tell us a little bit about the memorial that they have every April, and do you plan on having it again in person? Um, we have a memorial that was built by Justice for Homicide Victims at Rose Hills and next to our Homicide Victims Memorial is a, um, is a small tomb where Marcy is buried and Marcella and Marcella's husband, Bob. They're all buried there. And um, we have a memorial that we have over 300 pictures of homicide victims that we staged throughout the area. And um, we have singers that come in and sing and, and we've had lots of speakers from the governor's been there and spoken a couple of times, previous governors uh, during the last 20 years in, in California and um, victims rights people and the attorney general has been there. So it's a big event, assemblymen and senators and <laughs> lots of people. There's usually right around 300 people that attend. And, and it's really grown and you've, you've, you found it to be helpful back that very first time when your brother called you and said he saw something about it on TV and said that you guys should attend. I said, who knew? <laughs> who knew that, would, that I would get so involved in that over the next 20 years? Yeah. Well, and that I would, I mean, I'm so appreciative. I mean, some of my greatest friends have been in the victims rights movement. Marcella was just a, mo a wonderful woman who was always there for me, always there and um, her family too, so. Yeah, it, it is a, uh, a family that, that has really become such a powerful force um, and the, the legacy of, of this family, of, of their family and the victims' rights movement is really incredible to behold and to see partners like you and Colleen Campbell and Lenny Dunn uh, that you were talking about um, is, yeah everything that just makes that grow and becomes such such a force for good and such a such a righteous cause it's just um, we, we cannot cannot thank you enough and one one thing I wanted to just to, to just say as, as we as we wrap up the in order to get Marcy's law passed like we said um, before we have of so many groups of victims' rights um, organizations and law enforcement agencies in different states as we try to get it, uh, raise awareness and ultimately get it passed. And there are different groups for different parts of each step along along the way. Um, mm -hmm. You are, you single-handedly in California <laughs> got yourself involved in every step in the process. You raised the awareness, you got it on the ballot, you got it passed at the farmer's market where you got your signatures as well. Uh, and then you continue to help on the implementation, um, which is really just amazing work. Um, and the last thing I wanted to just bring up was you touched upon it a little bit, how things are changing in the law enforcement world, especially in California and in Los Angeles in particular, um, with respect to victims' rights and when victims are going to be present. Um, but Marcy's law hasn't changed and Marcy's law is still in the constitution and it is going to take people like you who are influential and who are strong and who have the resolve and will not be denied to continue to do what you do. And your, um, when you and I spoke, you, you were, you were telling me that so much has changed and that before what you wanted to do was to show the passion to get victims' rights, but and now, to, what what is it? You have to in, ensure that people know they have those rights, and that's that's the important process. Once you get them, they have to know they have them, that they're available, and what they have to do to make sure that they that they get those rights. And you know, one of the things that I've told people over the years that um, I had such a great DA that he would call me and tell me what was that there was going to be a, another hearing in court. And what was going to happen exactly? And lots of people never even hear from their DAs, and I found that I, in, incredible to me. But um, so it's important for me to that they know that they have rights and that they communicate with people about those rights. Well, I 
I appreciate that. We appreciate that as part of Marcy's Law. Thank you for being such an important part of Marcy's Law from the very beginning, right through <laughs> till today and going forward. And please continue to have your voice heard. So like you said, so victims actually know they have these rights and they still have these rights. Thank you for having me. And you know, I need to say thank you to everybody in JHV. They're a great group that we all support each other and we're, all, we're there for each other all the time. So thank you. Th thank you, Jane. Have a great day. You too. Thanks mm, for bye -bye. joining us.